Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 799. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is April 4th, 2023. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could join us. The audience makes a show. George and I just get to talk about the news and how fun Florida is and what's going on around the world. And I guess every week I should provide a little trigger warning. Uh, the audience is growing. Not everybody who listens to this show is Christian. And we want to be sure you know that this comes from a, a Christian perspective of two people who are real believers, who walk the walk and talk the talk, And that may be uncomfortable, even for some believers. So uh, just want to give that trigger warning up front. This is Holy Week. This is a busy week. But before we get too far into the episode, please like this, share this, go to the comment section and comment on it. Uh, That keeps uh, the content fresh and the algorithms at YouTube and Facebook interested in our program. George, uh, have you written your 5,000 sermons for Holy Week yet? No. It's exciting time, Kevin. Actually, the bulk of my time will be taken up into pastoral visitations at the nursing homes and the shut-ins we have. Our uh, young people are putting together little Easter eggs for the shut-ins. Instead of jelly beans and candy for the kids, we have hospital socks and non-diabetic sugar-free candies and and little tracks for... uh, the nursing homes and the older people. This is an older community. We don't have as many children. We have more older people than we have children. Uh, It's one of the oldest, I think the fourth oldest county in the United States in terms of the age of the population. Age, yes, demographic. I think think yours might be the third or the fifth, uh, uh, Sumter County, but uh, we're in the the, uh, retiree belt. We have cows and old people here in this part of our state. So (laughs) No, it's true. And, and, And you have snowbirds. Here in Central mm-hmm. Florida, um, when I'm driving down the road out to Webster, Florida here, which is the, the mega city of 300 next to us, uh, most of the license plates from November until April 15th are out of state. And that's because people in the north who are retired or have a remote, remote job or have disposable income come down to Florida for the weather. They don't want to be up in uh, North Dakota where today, George, there's a blizzard warning. Okay, I get it. You don't want a blizzard warning on April 4th, you come to Florida. And so, you know, it, it's interesting to see. Now, all that changes during April. Uh, we were driving to church in Tampa um, on Sunday, and you could see the motorhomes starting to come out of Flo- the southern Florida, the more and more cars. We had friends who left here on April 1st uh, to head north, and they said it's just jam traffic all the way north. Because at some point, it gets too warm down here to justify being down here. And I think we're right at that, that tipping point uh, for Florida. Um, all right, we should move on to the news. Um, I got my, my sheet up here somewhere. There we go. Uh, biggest news story that I saw on Anglican.inc. Ten clergy have formed a new breakaway deanery uh, in the Diocese of London. Cries foul. Hey, you can't do that. Well, let's talk a little bit about first... Not everybody here is an Anglican. They're not going to know what deaneries are. And uh, what provoked this and why the Diocese of London is uh, crying foul, George? Yeah, a deanery is a subdivision of a diocese mm-hmm. led by an area dean or a local dean or a rural dean, depending mm-hmm. upon the group. I was for many years the dean of Northwest Central Florida, meaning the four counties across this part of the state. I was the... Uh, person who basically the bishop delegated almost no authority to in our case. Well, 10 clergy, younger clergy in the city of London area, which is sort of the east around uh, the Tower of London in the financial district, some ancient churches there, have formed an all parallel deanery. They uh, object to the Bishop Sarah Mullally's stance on advocating for gay marriage. They do not think this is within the Christian religion. And they have not left the Church of England. They're just forming their own parallel structure. Now, we don't know how deep this goes, whether they're going to redirect their money from the existing City of London deanery to the new parallel deanery. 
And if it does, that will essentially wipe out any income for the local area. But this is a major step because people are putting, uh, there's a phrase in America, putting your money where your mouth is. In other words, you can talk the talk, but when you start actually using your resources and deploying your resources in a uh, way that is uh, backs up your words, that's a major action. And the Diocese of London responded very badly, hitting back saying, no, 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 you can't do this. This is no legal standing. We're going to... Uh, we're going to ignore the fact that you're doing this, but we're screaming bloody murder that you're doing it. Yes. Well, here's when I read the story, my first thought was like, okay, more acronym mud. You know, when people say there's a solution for the Church of England um, and it's AMIE or it's this or it's that, and now there's a thousand solutions. Now there's another solution, and that's to form a parallel deanery in the Diocese of London, and maybe more dioceses will take. Th that up, but um, is this a, a long-term, uh, we're going to fight and stay uh, tradition? Because I don't remember this happening in the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church isn't as hierarchical as the uh, Church of England is. Mm -hmm. Archdeacons and deans actually have authority and responsibilities. In the Episcopal Church, the bishop uh, is the one who basically says how much authority his deans may have. And some bishops give great authority to, others give only, you, you get a nice title for three to five years and that's it. So it would make no sense in the American setting to set up a parallel deanery because you, your own deanery doesn't do anything. I haven't been to a deanery meeting since I stopped being the dean. Uh, the uh, English setting though, Going back a uh, little history here, when the issue of ordination of women arose, traditionalists, evangelicals and Anglo-Catholics put forward the proposal that the current structures of two geographic provinces in the Church of England, Canterbury and York, one led by the Archbishop of Canterbury, the other by the Archbishop of York, that a third non-geographic province be created for those who could not accept the ordination of women. And this proved to be very popular, but the powers that be refused to cede any authority because what would have happened was that the parishes with money and, and people would have gone into this third province. Now, this idea is being resurrected, but it's being started on a lower level. Let's start with third province idea yeah. on a deanery level, and then maybe we can have because we have pseudo third province diocese with the flying bishop, but again, the flying bishop is, uh, he is like a dean in the Episcopal Church of the USA. He has as much authority as the local diocesan wants to give him. Yeah. Under the old bishop, when I was dean, I was given a great deal of authority to organize activities, education, you know, disseminate news from the diocese, check up on people. When, the, when we changed bishops about six, seven years ago, <clears throat> eight years ago, excuse me, uh, the new bishop wanted to centralize everything. So there was no point in my staying being dean because there was nothing to do except show up at dean meetings in Orlando and hear what the bishop wanted uh, everybody to do. Well, no, I agree. So, in, in, in different places, uh, in most places around the Episcopal Church, it, the, the senior dean just gets to put that on his business card. There's not a yeah. lot that goes with it. Mm-hmm. But that's very different in England. Mm -hmm. So these uh, innovations that they're coming up with in the city are a threat really to the hierarchical structure. They're saying essentially to the bishop and to the existing dean of the city of London deanery, we don't need you, we don't want you. And we can operate just as well without you, thank you, as we can with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting to watch this because uh, obviously there's, they're putting a line in the sand uh, and they're saying, you know, we need to separate ourselves from not quite the identity of the uh, Diocese of London, but certainly the the the, archae the, the leadership with Aaron. So, but he, the, I think why this is so threatening in my experience and view is that 
when a dean has nothing else to do but be a dean, when his parish is essentially moribund, or if he doesn't even have parish responsibilities at all, if he's just a bureaucrat, then any threat to his authority is a major crisis. For me, being a dean was five, two to five percent of my time any week. So if that disappears off my plate, all the better because I can go put that time into the real work that I'm doing, the work that matters of building, building the kingdom of Christ, winning souls to Christ. Because the hierarchy in the Church of England exists for the hierarchy's sake, rather than for believers, rather than to bring people to Christ, rather than as being an arm of evangelism and mission, they panic when that authority is threatened. It's not a sense where, like George, well, good for them, let's take some of the burden off my shoulders, yeah. but rather... All I do is be a dean and get to write letters and demand reports and this and that, and I have no real link to the real work of the church. So that's why the Diocese of London is so snippy about this, because it basically says, you know, it's basically taking away the reason for these people to exist. Yeah, and you think the lack of doctrine would do that, but I'm glad the, that they, well, that's you know, <laughs> you know, what's that got to do with it? So it's good to see that there's some action going on over there. Um, <laughs> The Church of England, that's going to be a long haul if it's going to be reformed uh, or if the, there's other answers that can be provided uh, through the Global South, GAFCON, and, and other structures. So we shall keep watching and reporting what's going on there. Last week, we reported on Oak Hill, who uh, let go of their uh, dean. And we kind of complained about the statement they put forward. And there's just no information. Why is he gone? They've clarified it without really clarifying in a statement posted on Anglica.ichgeorge. Yes. Uh, Julian Mann, uh, who writes for Anglican Inc. and Evangelicals Now, a British newspaper, really beat the drum about how unpleasant the leaders at Oak Hill were over the defenestration of Jonathan Jukes, the dean who has been who was resigned, forced out, we don't know why. Um, and after complaints and after being raised in this show and, uh, and, and conservative Anglican media, they put up a supplemental statement, which as you said, Ken, doesn't really say anything else other than we want to do what we want to do and who are you to tell us how to do what we want to do? Yeah. Well, we've t we snooped around, and essentially it was just an issue of Jonathan Jukes was just felt to be heavy-handed, and he didn't stroke the right uh, feathers on the right goose. Uh, no scandals or anything like that. It's just, you know, uh, round uh, s square peg and a round hole sort of stuff. And it's not a cover-up. You know, normally you see a poorly written statement, uh, i.e. AMIA many years ago, and you go, there must be smoke there. You look into it. Here we looked into it, and we, we asked for a little clarification what's going on, and we got it. Um, and you can tell from the clarification, there's probably not a lot going on because they got nothing really to say coherently. You know? so. But the, the bigger picture, and I think the reason why this story had legs, was that this spoke to a culture within the conservative evangelical world in England of, of cover-up, of just do what the boss says of, you know, don't question authority, don't ask questions, do as you're told. And that may have worked. It may have worked in the old class bound system that was conservative evangelicalism, but that's, that's dead and it doesn't exist outside of uh, certain confines in England anymore. Yeah. So the old ways of doing stuff just are not going to work. All right, let's move on to our next story. Uh, Anglican TV was formed in 2008. And since 2008, you can uh, kind of watch the uh, popularity of Anglican TV grow in Anglican Unscripted and Anglican.inc, uh, which is great. But you can also put in that timeline the slow death of Episcopal seminaries. You know, and it's hard to watch, but we've reported on this now for uh, a good 13, 14, 15 years. And I don't think that reporting is going to stop until there's no more seminaries. And the latest one to go kaput, don't know for sure, Episcopal Divinity School. Holy Episcopal cow. Divinity School. 
Well, Episcopal Divinity School itself was a merger of the Episcopal Theological School and the Philadelphia Divinity School. Yeah. And that took place, I think, in the 80s or in the 90s, 80s, excuse me. Hmm. And with Philadelphia shutting down, it was next to the University of Pennsylvania, the campus, and moving everything up to Cambridge, where Episcopal Divinity School was next to Harvard. A few years ago, it too shut down, and part of it was due to dreadful leadership. Uh, the dean was just, a, uh, she was the Episcopal priest, was famous for saying abortion is a sacrament. Yes, yes. And just, uh, it was one of these abortion, uh, yeah. get woke, go broke sort of things. Yeah. Well, also the changing dynamics of theological education. Older people don't really want to live in student dormitories and leave their families and this and that for three-year residential education, all that stuff. This is the same thing every other seminary is facing. However, EDS was basically decided to sell its campus and it merged itself with Union Theological Seminary in Manhattan. Now, Union is a very liberal seminary ne located next door to Columbia University, and it absorbed ETS's faculty and what few students they had left, maybe a dozen, and started an Anglican program at UTS. UTS itself only has 200 students, but it has all this Rockefeller money, yes. so it's not going anywhere. It will be there forever. Well, it was just announced this last week that uh, the agreement with UTS and EDS, Union Theological Seminary and Episcopal Divinity School, had been rescinded, and Episcopal Divinity School has been cut off. Now, what this means is that it's no longer is it going to be a degree-granting institution. It doesn't won't have a campus. It won't have students. It'll just... At 2017, I think, when... Last I remember, they had fifty million in cash yeah, from, the money, from the sale of the buildings. Yeah. So basically, they've got money. Uh, they're not gaining any new income except through investments, and they just have faculty to employ. So essentially, this is going to be a sinecure of something, of somewhere, of somebody. And until the money runs out, it'll employ a few whacked out nut jobs who can uh, conduct online seminars. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. EDS is, for all intents and purposes, gone. Well, my question is, you know, five years ago, it, there was $50 million in an account. Where'd that go? Does it still exist? If you're going to dissolve as a not-for-profit, spread that around. Anglican TV could always use some money. Well, we'll take a little bit and help you out. Um, we're going but back see, to the, purpose of these, the purpose of these liberal groups is to give jobs to otherwise unemployable people, Kevin. Yes. Uh, if they were in the real world and uh, market uh, forces were there to uh, guide their salaries, they'd be unemployable. They'd be working at Starbucks mm -hmm. as baristas. But these th these foundations, these places exist to, to, to basically keep members of the uh, the woke class in house and home, hearth and home. Yeah. I think it was five, maybe seven years ago, we reported on a uh, lady who was allowed to read from the Quran during a service at a Church of England. Uh, I don't know if it's a cathedral. I think it was a was it Church of somewhere Scottish think, Episcopal Church in Scottish, Glasgow. Yeah. yeah, and this is what led to Gavin Ashton in making a public protest mm -hmm. and his being quietly asked to step it down as a Queen's Chaplain mm -hmm. because. The bureaucrats at uh, Buckingham Palace didn't want to upset Muslims. And Gavin said, you cannot pray the, At I think it's the Atnan, the, there is no God but Muhammad, and Allah is his prophet from the pulpit of an Anglican church. And Doesn't doing it at the way. cathedral in Glasgow is abhorrent. And the Church of England set up rules saying, this is what, these are the parameters of interfaith work. You can have people over, you can have this and that, but you can't do that. But that's, I think, what you're referring to. Uh, yeah, that's it. So, yeah, I started my story. Your memory is so much better than mine. You know, uh, I, we reported on that for weeks, and it was a, a, a big hit on Anglican Inc. at the time. And we had the we had the recorded video of her uh, reading from the Quran, and uh, she protested and filed copyright lawsuits, and um, we had we eventually had to take it down because, well, we we respect the law. However, it's happening again. 
the Church of England has opened some cathedrals to uh, the Muslim call of prayer. And I'm going to say right now, George, I'm uncomfortable with that as a Christian because the call of prayer is saying there's only one God and his name is Allah. It divides, denies the divinity of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Muhammad's Muslims respect Jesus as a prophet. Yes, it is. But he is not the son of God. He did not die on the cross. He is not God. He's a prophet. And part of the Muslim prayer calls accentuate this, that there is no God but Allah, and his name is not Jesus. Well, the cathedrals in Bradford and um, Manchester held iftar dinners, and these are dinners to mark the start of Ramadan. We roasted Justin Welby last week for equating Ramadan with Lent. No, they're very different. But uh, at these dinners, the uh, of course, the, cross, the screens were put up, which sort of hid the cross in the cathedral in uh, Manchester, and the Muslim call was made in the prayer. Part of, it's part of the dinner, it's part of the ritual. Well, uh, people wrote to the deans of these cathedrals saying, you know, you can't do this, you're violating church rules. There was an article in The Spectator, it was all pointed out, nobody's saying that this is permissible, but the deans in both ba cases basically said, yeah, we're going to do what we're going to do. It's more important for us to be palsy wowsy with our local Muslim confreres than it is to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Um, this is, on one level, it's not surprising, but on another, uh, as you mentioned, uh, this was a scandal when it happened in the Glasgow Cathedral, when uh, the church, there was a church. Uh, near Waterloo Station in London a few years ago, did this, and that priest was firmly sat on by the Bishop of Southwark. Um, same thing. And now the deans, deans in the England, the part of the hierarchy, the structure, are able to do this with impunity in Bradford and Manchester, which have large Muslim populations. So rather than trying to bring Christ to their Muslim immigrant neighbors, uh, these deans are seeking to domesticate Christianity and de de Christ de, de Jesus it de, de, de Christ it. <laughs> well, it's kind of making a, a universal church again, you know, the a Unitarian type church where mm -hmm. all all faiths lead to to heaven. And in doing so, is this kind of that that place where ecumenicalism needs to to stop? And uh, you will not find a uh, Muslim holy place that allows for Christian prayers, mm -hmm. that allows for the return to be offered. Uh, you, you're not going to go into a, uh, a, a a Muslim holy place and f see the Eucharist demonstrated. Not going to happen. So they understand where ecumenicalism stops. Why don't Christians? Yeah. So well, Christians do. Christ, here's the thing. Okay, right, yeah. Christians understand. Uh -huh. Who do not understand are the deans of Manchester and Bradford. Yeah. Are they Christians? Not recognizably so. Yeah, if this uh, is how they act, and not speak. in the tradition I understand. Again. Yeah. I, yeah, I I agree. I just you know I wish it was more outcry. You know, this is something that you know the global South should be responding to as well. Um, the, yeah. Well, well, Kevin, I mean, we've had things like this in the past uh, with the Masa you know, the Masons, re uh, the Freemasons redid part of Canterbury Cathedral, and in return, the all-seeing eye was engraved with uh, some Masonic symbols into the stonework of the cathedral. Now, Freemasonry uh, worships the demon Bahomet uh, at you know, you're a local free, you're a local group of Masons who get in their little cars for the Shriners kids and all that. I'm not talking about that, but the upper no, no. levels and the, the, in the, the, the true initiates into Masonry, mm -hmm. it is demonic and Freemasons, uh, Masonry is absolutely rejected in all forms by much of the Anglican world. 
But in exchange for money, the dean at Canterbury has allowed it to be desecrated. And, you know, at that time, uh, it was an uproar. But, you know, you get so exhausted, Kevin, with these continuing uh, blasphemies that at a certain point you just say, oh, whatever. Uh, they're just going to do what they're going to do. On to our next story, kind of related. The Bishop of Missouri for the Episcopal Church says he wants to ban Christian Seder meals. Now, let me give you a little backdrop. This is not when our church would always invite the local rabbi uh, around Passover to come in and demonstrate a Seder meal for us. And we'd all sit in our little uh, church tables with our pulled up folding chairs and they, they would uh, put the different elements in front of us and we would taste the, the different forms in, in the Seder meal. It was wonderful, delivered to us by a, a local rabbi. It was fun. This is different, George. He, he wants to ban the Christian Seder version of this. And, and I think it's a great story. Dion Johnson, Bishop of Missouri, uh, took the right move for the wrong reasons. Dion Johnson put out a letter to his diocese saying this new habit of having these sort of Easter seders mm -hmm. where we ape or mimic the uh, Jewish tradition of a seder meal at Passover, it's not a good idea. Please don't do it. Now, Bishop Johnson's rationale was that this was supersessionist. This was, in essence, trying to colonize modern Judaism and take some of their rituals and take out the Jewishness and make them Christian. Well, I don't, that, uh, well, it, that's a reason, it's not a good reason. The good reason is that, you know, we have our own traditions and we should celebrate them and not, uh, not worry about offending three Jews somewhere. Uh, who will always be offended by anything done. Um, oh, I don't know if I'm saying this well, but uh, right outcome, wrong way to get there, I think is sure. how I would say yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And no, like our church, yeah. we're having a, our, our church, we're having a big meal on Wednesday, but I don't think anyone will, a parish dinner, but because we're having big hams, I don't think anyone will confuse it with the Seder meal. Uh, but it, it's it, there's a tendency in some evangelical Christian groups, independent groups, to ape aspects of the Jewish faith and religion and not appreciate that a lot of these Jewish things that they're trying to take over are period are things that are post temple mm -hmm. is uh, Judaism things right. that developed in the Jewish world after Christ after the Christians left the synagogue. And they're, they're, do, they're playing with things they don't really understand what they're doing. I don't think it's heretical or terrible evil. I just don't think it's particularly wise. Yeah, well, and I agree. This is not, you're not doing something evil here. It's certainly not uh, on the level of heresy. Uh, there's so much going on wrong with the church. And this is also, to me, kind of a misplaced ecumenicalism. You know, we, we want to show people we're friendly and we understand their culture and in my opinion, this doesn't really do it. But if you're doing it, I'm not the bishop who's going to oppose it. Just you got to understand why you're doing it. Um, and then, th then there comes a the thing. Uh, the Bishop of Missouri really doesn't have the authority to ban a Seder meal because it's not a liturgical event. Yeah. It's a social event. And he's overstepping his authority by essentially claiming that anything that happens within an Episcopal parish, I can say you know, whether or not it's permissible. Well, you know, you can't do that. The yeah, authority is... over the use of structures in the church belongs to the record, rector. Now, for vicars, TA can do that, no problem. But for rectors, no, you really can't do that. Yeah, That's an overstep is, of authority. It's not the Pope in Latin Mass. You really can't uh, go clamping down and everything like that. Uh, let's move on to another news story, the Global South has issued their Holy Week message, and it's full of a lot of stuff, George. Uh, I'm going to say, packed full. Uh, in fact, for, as far as uh, Easter messages, it's quite the read. And I thought, uh, I want to point viewers to it. It's on ang to it on anglica.inc. And uh, let's talk a little bit uh, about some of the highlights, George. 
Well, it doesn't say anything new in the sense of this new initiative starts tomorrow. Yeah. But there, are, for but for those who are those who eyes who can see and ears who can hear, there's an immense number of things happening. Uh, in no no specific order, the Church of Uganda has now signed up to uh, the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans, and the Church of Nigeria supports this Holy Week statement. So what we're seeing is we're seeing a collaboration closer and closer of GAFCON and the Global South, with some of GAFCON having dual membership. We're not seeing a merger. We're seeing collaboration. Now, pause there. Well, so what? What that means is we still have two groups that see themselves as the opposition to the Welby communion, Welbyism, or the Lambeth uh, Lambeth centered communion. Right. So the there will be a meeting of Global South primates in May, their standing committee, and also many of them will be going to the Kigali meeting at GAFCON. Well, there will be ongoing discussions about areas of authority. Will GAFCON be more evangelistic and mission oriented, and Global South more uh, church pol politics issue? You know, those have not yet to be worked out, but. What we're seeing here is that the momentum is moving against Justin Welby. What, we're, what we've got is uh, the Global South team is increasing. And churches that may not have signed on the dotted line support the rejection of the Church of England General Synod's statements on gay marriage. Central Africa. Uh, for instance, in the West Indies and I think Mexico and other places have said, no, this is not right, what General Synod did. However, we're not going to break with the Church of England. But that's not the real issue, breaking. The real issue is basically having the communion as one say, what you've done is wrong. And the momentum, the, how should I put this? Welby is losing ground with the Global South. His traditional allies aren't there to stand with him anymore. South Africa, his only ally on the African continent, uh, its archbishop was handed a massive defeat when the House of Bishops there refused to allow the blessing of gay civil unions. Mm -hmm. um, Tabo Makoba had a commission with his handpicked people on it to give him the hand, give him the desired outcome he wanted. And they got it, which the commission says, here's why we need to do this. And the bishop said, no, we're not going to do it. And Makoba came back with, well, we'll talk about it and find a way to talk about what we'll all agree. That's a face-saving uh, device to basically say that South Africa is no longer on the plantation for Justin Welby. And the Global South understand this and realize this. Yeah. It, the, the future favors the Global South and Gafka. And in mm -hmm. what structures they end up in you know five ten years from now we don't know yet but both understand the communion cannot continue without accountability at the archbishop and provincial level there we, we need to have some way we can hold provinces accountable and we need some way where we, we can we can have a a non-canterbury led communion for the future mm -hmm. the Another thing that I would mention is that the Global South is a little bit more sophisticated than, say, the Church of Nigeria in dealing with uh, the gay issue. I'll put it that way. Sure. Yeah. There was a flap in the past few weeks where the, where the R Rwandan parliament adopted a bill that stiffens the current sodomy laws. In other words, penalizing the propagation of gay groups and uh, homosexual acts and things like that. Now, never mind that essentially the same laws were already on the book with books since the 1960s, and nobody was ever pro prosecuted under them. Laws in, Uga in Africa are aspirations; they're not really, uh, you know, done. In the past, when Nigeria did this, Justin Welby would ring up the Nigerians, and Nigerians would say, well, who are you to tell us what to do? And so Justin Welby could 
wrap himself in this mantle of, oh, we just want to be nice, and you be people are being so cruel, and this and that. Well, sure as the sun rises, the uh, Justin Welby and the Bishop in Wales, Andy John, Archbishop there, wrote to their counterpart in Uganda saying, oh, this is terrible what the Ugandan government is doing. And the Church of Uganda basically says, you're right, it's the Ugandan government. Individuals in our church may support it, they may not. But we don't write to you every time the church, the British Parliament does something that we disagree with. We disagree with uh, the uh, laws that the Parliament has passed with uh, no prayer zones around abortion clinics. Yeah. But do we complain to you about it? Um, so in essence, the the ability, the, the Global South has sort of taken away one of the clubs that the liberals in the West have used to beat GAFCON in the past with, um, which is sort of provoking GAFCON, provoking people to in to make statements that can then be beaten up to embarrass Westerners who support GAFCON or the Global South. Yeah, well, Global South isn't playing the game that GAFCON used to play on these yeah. issues. I mean, a quick clarification: You started by saying Rwanda sodomy laws. It's Uganda that was uh, Uganda. I'm Uganda. sorry, I, I sorry, misspoke. Okay. We need to, with our global audience. You need to be really clear on that. That uh, there's new laws proposed by the uh, the government of Uganda, and the church said, "Not us," you know. And so. also, the president hasn't signed this law into effect. No. Um, so, and we saw this last year where the uh, the the European Union Ghana has uh, stiffened its sodomy laws last year. And the European Union says, if you do this, we're going to cut aid. Mm -hmm. And the you got and the Ghanaian Parliament said, well, you're not going to tell us what to do like that. And the Church in Ghana, Anglican Church in Ghana, said, we support our national integrity. We may not agree with every jot and tittle in this law, but we are actually incensed that you Europeans would tell us this is how we have to arrange our affairs in order for us to be given aid money. Um, that scenario is no longer working. The U.S. government does this uh, in across Africa, saying aid is conditioned upon political correct policies by your governments. Um, and it's no longer working anymore. The, the African governments are basically saying, stop it. Part of it is that Russia and China are now more influential than they were ever before. And the US has abdicated so much of its global responsibilities, but that'll get us into politics and Joe Biden, and that's a different <laughs> podcast. Well, I mean, you, you, but you're right. The the influence now of China money all through North Africa and uh, East Africa is amazing. They put a lot of money in that long-term for them is five, 10, $15 million per country is a great payoff. Uh, down the road to have that support and that structure of support where uh, the governments of those countries owe money back to China. Uh, anytime that uh, a, a African country or an Asian country has been indebted to America, we are quick to forgive. That's not so much with China. China is quick to collect. <laughs> so well, I, I don't know if people pick this it's not appeared in the Western media in any prominence, but mm. uh, two weeks ago, China is really heavily, as you mentioned, you're absolutely right, Kevin. Mm. One of the places is Central African Republic, which is where one yeah. of the places where they have all these cobalt and gold mines. Islamic terrorists uh, killed 25, 20 or 25 Chinese workers at a mine, singling out just the Chinese uh, because uh, they were foreign atheists and this and that. Now, China is in bed with Iran and Islamic Jihad and all this and that. So on one area, they're friends. We're on the ground in Africa. Uh, they're killing each other. So it's haha uh, amusing. It's not, but still. It's, it's not amusing. But I mean, international politics is not what it was in the 70s. Uh, international politics is taking on uh, a bigger dynamic because people have learned to play the game. You know, and the game is, isn't is really fought with nuclear weapons anymore. It's fought with money. And uh, 
you know power is is, is that that money structure we're having a, a mini cold war here and a mini cold war there and an iron curtain uh doesn't make for the long run we're introducing marxism to education why is my camera bounce i'm sorry uh in an rv my camera's on the mattress it's going to bounce a little it's just the way it is okay so um Politics is much different now than it was when we, we were younger, George, for sure. I'm just holding the camera still because I think it's me bouncing around. All right, so let's move on here. Is that the last story? I know Aaron Edwards is the last story. Uh, he posted a little uh, critique of something on Twitter that re referred to uh, the LGTB community and schooling and got fired. He was canceled by his school. And we should talk about this uh, UK story, George. Uh, Aaron Edwards is a 37 year old, was a 37 year old professor at Cliff College, which is a Methodist uh, tradition school in Derbyshire. And he put out a post uh, on a tweet that essentially said that uh, part of the gay agenda is to take over Christianity or worse to that effect, which is absolutely correct. There yeah, are many activists who seek to. Uh, and for this, Cliff College suspended and then fired him for bringing the college into disrepute on social media. They, the Methodist Church in the UK has just collapsed completely, utterly, in terms of attendance and this and that. And it's now become far left. It's akin to the United Methodist Church, the kooky, the kooky crowd in the American uh, version. Uh, it's very different from the Methodist Church in other parts of the world, Africa and Asia. Well, even though the college has on its website all these statements of Christian principles and its belief in scripture and this and that, when one of its professors aired a view, view that in subsequent conservations, uh, subsequent tweets that was fully Christian and fully scriptural, pressure by the literate and the woke uh, elements of Methodism insisted that this man be canceled. So, and it, it's just appalling. It's just appalling. It's appalling. There is no, how many times over this, the last 50 years have we had Episcopal seminary, Episcopal divinity, Episcopal seminary professors say stuff that is totally whacked out nonsense and none of them ever got fired. None of them ever got uh, canceled. Well, it's only we, the right who gets canceled. It is, because we had famous trials in the Episcopal Church with Ryder and Spong, where they were brought up on charges, and in the end, the bishops could not find within themselves to hold charges against these gentlemen. And by not holding them accountable, they've set the tone for the Episcopal Church forever. And... Well, it, yeah, and even that we had professors like Carter Hayward in the mm. 80s and 90s. Good example. Divinity School, Very, yeah. who, who, essentially, who gave up on the divinity of Christ and became effectively Unitarians. Mm. They're never disciplined. They're never set on. It was all because the left has free full freedom of speech for free and full academic discourse. But when Aaron Edwards put forward a non-controversial from a conservative Christian perspective statement about Christ and human sexuality, he gets nailed. And it takes the canceled culture to a different level. People, and I've discussed this in previous episodes, are afraid to speak up because they're afraid of the financial consequences of speaking up. They have that built-in fear, I won't be able to feed my family or I won't be able to hold a job anymore because you're not just fired from your current job, you are displayed in public as a hater, as a phobic, and that's on newspapers, that's on websites. And so when you go to another job and they do a quick Google search of Kevin Coulson, hit enter, all this stuff that's bad about Kevin comes up and they go, I, you know, he's talented, he's got the right stuff, uh, smart as a whip, can solve any problem, but he comes with a bit of a, a baggage. And we don't want to hire Kevin because... Uh, it would make other employees uncomfortable. And if he said something on Facebook that uh, was uncomfortable to our company, we would have to let him go. But he would embarrass our company before we had to let him go. And there's that whole new cancel dynamic that is stopping people from saying no. That stopping people from saying, 
we don't want to go that far. Uh, this new uh, Dylan, what's his face, uh, is the the new Dylan Mulvaney. Yeah, is the new spokesman for Bud Light because he has uh, been a woman for 365 days, even though he hasn't had the surgery and he's just taking the hormones. And Bud Light had nothing better to do with their imposter beer than uh, hire an imposter woman. Uh, you know, and if I were to truly put out there on social media my opinion on this, uh, although I can't technically be canceled, it could affect other people in my life. And, you know, there's no way. I, I, I too, keep my opinion just to Anglican Unscripted. Well, this takes us up to the very first story we did, the 10 clergy in the City of London deanery. Mm-hmm. The point is from reach where 10 clergy out of, I don't know about of how many, 20, 30, are willing to say, this is, this is enough. Mm-hmm. I think we've reached the point where people are beginning to stand and say, I will not take this anymore. I will not uh, avert my eyes from the carnage of the faith that is being committed by the elites, by the bishops, by the professors. But we're going to remain faithful to God. I mean, this, this first story could be a bit of a so what, but for me it is, I think, a symbol that uh, there is life and there is hope for faithful Anglicans in England, in the Church of England. Yeah. And that's a wonderful thing to share. It is. And we have to reach the point where we stop and say no, and we do it with not the bravery of us, but the bravery of Christ that is within us. Uh, he will be the, the, the person who speaks through us and defend us. Uh, I, yeah. Kevin, I preached oh, two Sundays ago, was it last Sunday, about uh, Lazarus and the tomb that, you know, Lord, if you had loved the Church of England, you would have been here and not let it die. Uh, and, oh, Lord, Lazarus, he stinketh. I always love that phrase. Well, the Church of England has died, and it stinketh. It does pretty bad, yeah. But Jesus Christ can resurrect the Church of England uh, just yeah. by a call. Yeah. And we're, and maybe it's going to be, may not come in, in, an, in an engraved letter to the Archbishop of Canterbury, but it will come to individuals, to men and women, lay and ordained, who will answer this call and come out of the tomb and no yeah. longer stinketh. No, I desire and hope for a day when there is another Archbishop of Canterbury worthy of Christian martyrdom. Yeah, so. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 799 of Anglican Unscripted.